Well, good morning, everybody. On this Friday morning, here's some of the uh, content we're going to cover here over the next little bit. We're going to talk first about uh, what's happened with Debbie, uh, the look at the precipitation all across the southeast and now into the northeast. We'll then focus on the following tropical systems that we expect to develop and look at some of the conditions that uh, might be ripe for the development of that system and if it could hit the east coast. I'll give you the latest update from Colorado State University on the hurricane season before we transition into looking at the pattern across the rest of North America. After that, we're going to do that model analysis again. The artificial intelligence has been very aggressive on some rainfall totals. We need to look at some of the transitions in that model toward um, kind of pushing around where the heavy rain is going to be. And then we'll compare that to the others. And then at the end of this, we're going to go long range again. There's still a lot of uncertainty about uh, the rest of August into September with the temperature pattern, which we talked about yesterday. But I'm going to focus at the very end on what's going on with La Nina, what are some of the forecasts, and how are the models responding? Because we did get some new national multi-model ensemble data in, and I'm going to look at that for both North and South America. All right, that's where we're going. This is where we're going to start. The upper level pattern right now, which is helping to drive Debbie toward the northeast, features this deeper trough you can see here this morning as the sun rises, digging into the Great Lakes. It's interesting, right here in this part of South Dakota, I think the skies cleared out enough last night that we watched the temperatures drop down into the 30s. We're going to look at that in a few moments. The National Weather Service did put out a frost advisory for this particular area. A couple of the areas, or excuse me, a couple of the weather stations this morning did dip down to 36. Also take note of this, uh, the storms that lined up right around the monsoonal flow that got into New Mexico, the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas right now, uh, last night delivered a lot of rainfall to some very needed areas in terms of getting some precipitation into that region. And throughout the West, we continue to monitor um, large fires. That's been kind of a, an ongoing story uh, throughout the Western United States for much of this summer. The latest on Debbie, this was just uh, a radar animation that starts late last night and goes through early this morning. Just kind of continuing to see that heavy rain spread through parts of Pennsylvania to New York. It was great to see some of this rain get into parts of Virginia and West Virginia and parts of um, Pennsylvania, which are regions we've been tracking that have been quite dry. But overall, when we look back on this just here in the last seven days, this is total accumulated precipitation through uh, midnight. And uh, just the amounts that we've seen fall from Florida into Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and now Virginia, and further into the Northeast, got several places that topped out well over 15 inches. You know, earlier this week when we were looking at the forecast maps of this, it, it, I will just make the statement again that some of the forecast maps were a bit too aggressive on total rainfall. You know, I say that and in the same breath say this is a tremendous amount of rain. If we just kind of zoom in there, uh, we can just have a close look at these last seven days in terms of the totals based off of the MRMS data. So widespread 13 to 15, a couple places up over 18 inches of rainfall uh, as this moved through. And uh, if we just transition a bit farther to the northeast and look at just the last three days, which is where the majority of this came from, uh, from Debbie, uh, just, just a lot of rainfall that got into the northeast. And so forecast models, I think, handled Debbie well once, once we saw where Debbie was going to go. Once it got onto the western side of Florida, that was when the models really, I think, honed in on the trajectory and the speed. Just as a reminder, the latest forecasts have sped up Debbie, getting it out of the United States quicker, and that's largely thanks to this deeper low that's sitting and spinning here. Now, remember, the drought monitor is created on Tuesday, and uh, we always look at it on Thursday or Friday. So it does not include the rainfall here from Debbie. So we still see some places there in um, Virginia and parts of West Virginia and Pennsylvania that are still in, um, you know, deep into drought. They're in that D3 extreme drought uh, case. But a lot of this is being, you know, wiped out since then. And we'll have to just see what the new drought monitor looks like next week. Overall, across the United States, we're about 52% of the land area covered in some form of drought. That would be including the abnormally dry category. We're up over 20% uh, when, it, uh, when you talk about uh, D1 through D4. Corn Belt, about 5% of it is in drought. And this is an area that we have big questions about rainfall coming through. We've already seen decent rains getting into uh, parts of Kansas, as an example. And we watched better rains coming right in through the panhandles last night. So when we think about where the drought has been expanding, let's go to the change maps tab. This is just the drought monitor change over the last couple of weeks. So again, because South Carolina had all that rain early in the week, we saw a two-class improvement here and almost wiping the drought out, of course, because of the flooding rains. Uh, but if we look back over a longer term, let's just go back over the last month. 
degradation in the drought has largely been in the central plains, the high plains, western plains, and throughout the western United States. So just a, a good way to kind of view where this precipitation pattern has kind of established itself. The soil moisture, of course, has responded, and that's what's going to make this upcoming forecast uh, precipitation about to share with you so critical. This region and through here has seen, um, you know, according to the modeling done by NASA, down at 40 centimeters or 16 inches, the, the soil moisture values are quite low. You can also see in parts of the delta here into the Ohio River Valley, we have places that have been uh, missing out on this. And I was just in Martin, Tennessee, then Owensboro this week, and I talked to several growers that live on this side of the Mississippi, and they're like, man, I, if I could just get to the east side of the Mississippi, I'd see better precip, and they've been feeling this local drought developing in this area. So again, this upcoming forecast for precip is going to be critical uh, just to see how this is all going to break down. Because our last 30 days, when you look at a percent of normal, uh, that's what you've got right here from the AHPS. Now, just as a reminder, this data is always one day old. So they have a, um, uh, when I show it to you early in the mornings, it's still going through quality control for the rest of the data from yesterday. So this is through 6 a.m. Central Time uh, or 7 a.m. Central Time on Thursday. So this is this corridor we're having to keep a very close eye on that lately gone over quite dry. We're going to talk more about the Northwest in just a few moments, but just keep an eye on this region because the newest forecast data continues from the artificial intelligence to be very aggressive on rainfall in key areas that need another push of some moisture. I'm really thinking about this area, not necessarily parts of Iowa uh, or Illinois, which had a, a relatively wet uh, and not hot July. But the farther south you go, the greater the risk is going to be for flash drought development. And this is my big concern for this region and through here. Repeatedly, the upper level flow pattern continues to be forecast to kind of keep troughs digging in and around this region. And, and that's going to suppress the ridging farther to the south, meaning that this will be the area over which I'm expecting to see continued heat and high evaporation rates and, of course, the flash drought scenario. We're going to look at that multiple ways here in a few moments. The big wild card is going to be the tropical system. So this is what's left of Debbie in the artificial intelligence forecast. You can see there's something going over here we have to talk about, something here we need to look at closely. And this is going to be the big wild card. I think this year the Gulf of Mexico is more ready than I've seen it in a while to produce systems. And given the position of the Bermuda High, if we ever get a little bit of a flex over toward the west in the Bermuda High, I think it's going to help push any tropical disturbance that's in the Atlantic or the Caribbean or over the, the you know the greater or lesser Antilles into the Gulf and spark something up here. So let's get in and talk about this hurricane setup we've got right now. We have Debbie, which is now uh, transitioned to post-tropical. It's been sheared apart. It's actually got a little bit of a colder core. That's all we mean when we say it's post-tropical. Still making a lot of rain. And then now the National Hurricane Center is up to a 50% chance on this next wave developing over the next seven days as it approaches the Lesser Antilles. And I want to go out and look at it several different ways. We're going to use one of my favorite sites, weathernerds.org. It's a great one. And we're going to use the European Ensemble. And what it's going to play for us here are the low pressure tracks. So we're just looking here to kind of keep an eye on where low pressure could form and, and move across uh, you know, the open Atlantic Ocean. I think a lot of you are looking at this going, man, that Bermuda High <clears throat> must be really opening up back to the east if we're going to curl you know, this low pressure around and keep it out to open ocean. And that seems to be the case when we kind of dig into the models. So let's start off here with the GFS. Let's get it queued up to where it's in forecast mode. There we go. So this is now. And then as I play this forward, let's take a look at what the GFS forecast model is doing. This is by uh, next Tuesday night. It's got a tropical system going over the Lesser Antilles, north of the Bahamas, eventually. We then see that the model tries to kick off a low that comes off of the mid-Atlantic. See this right here? And as that low goes, so imagine you're going to flow like this, flow coming around this high like this. This is going to grab this system. It's going to just trail it. And that will be very challenging for us to forecast how close to the east coast this one goes. But there's still pretty robust evidence that we're going to have a system somewhere out there next Saturday. So this is not this Saturday, but next Saturday, getting closer to the uh, east coast of the United States. Now, one thing to make a comment about, we're way out there. We're at, a, we're at more than a 10-day forecast in the map you're looking at here. And therefore, the speed and timing and strength and position of this, of course, will change. We're just getting the latest evidence we've got from, from one model here. I'm going to take it back to the beginning. 
Let's see what the ECMWF is saying. So that's what it's got for the rest of Debbie by tonight. And as we play this for, let's zip up a little bit here. What I can see is remember we're watching Tuesday. So there's midday or early day Tuesday. It also has a low sitting here. And then as we play this forward, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the European model, just take note of this, has this system leaving the East Coast a bit earlier, out to open ocean earlier, and that prevents a large area of high pressure from forming here, pushing the system farther toward the coast. Instead, the Bermuda High opens up much farther to the east in the European, and that's why this next system doesn't even get close in the European model. But the end of it is quite interesting, and this is what I'll be watching very closely on the model trends. Now, I want to be very clear so that no one misunderstands me. This is the very last time slot in the operational European model run, meaning we're at 240 hours. So when you see this thing deepening and heading toward like Acadia, we have to understand that so, you know, we can't, it's just one of these as you watch these again. So we need to just remember that the model spread is very large, but it all depends on how the extra tropical high and low pressure systems evolve at that point as to whether or not it's going to get toward the Northeast United States or even the Canadian Maritimes. We certainly know it can do that, right? Hurricane Lee did that last year. So let's go and have a look at some probability maps. As we play this forward, this is getting out there to next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we can now see that when you look at all of the European ensemble members, They've clearly got a pretty well-defined path right now uh, that's in that area. And so based on evidence I have today, it would appear that because of the position of the Bermuda High lows that are coming across the north interior of the United States, that this might be the best forecast um, guidance I've got. So we'll watch it. We know the Atlantic is going to stay hot and go. Uh, we are currently looking at a very active hurricane season. The Atlantic is still very warm. The Atlantic meridional mode is still very positive. And as a result, we are, um, you know, we're, we're set up for a very active hurricane season over the next 80 days. There's still 80 more days of this hurricane season to go. I want to show you a series of graphics I look at every day. I don't often show them to you just, just for the sake of, of brevity, even though I know you all know I'm not brief in these. But this is the main graphic on here I like to look at. Uh, it's this one right here, the 850 to 200 hectopascal vertical shear. And you can see that in each category, there's a black line and a blue line. The blue line is the observations this year. The black line is the historical values. What I'm really looking closely at, it would be the Gulf of Mexico. Because if we keep the shear low in the Gulf of Mexico, which it is right now, and it has been uh, for a while, this is just going to ripen the environment for tropical development. I'm, just, I'm concerned more about the Gulf of Mexico this year than I've been in the past uh, for this being one of the reasons. Colorado State University did update their forecast for the 2024 hurricane season. In my opinion, they're some of the best in the business at doing this. A ton of respect for their work. They did back off slightly on some of the numbers, <clears throat> but I don't want that to distract from the overall scenario that's being painted here. Um, average being 14.4 named systems. They were at 25. They're now at 23. That would still completely exhaust our hurricane name list, taking us two names deep into the Greek alphabet. Uh, but in every category that you know they're measuring here, we're expecting you know 150 to you know a doubling of a typical hurricane uh, season based on their analysis. And there's certainly a lot that we can uh, you know we, we that makes sense to me in this particular forecast. So that's uh, what I want to share with you in the hurricane season. Let's now get back to the pattern across the rest of North America. And I'm going to use the artificial intelligence forecast because it was one of the earlier models to give us a little bit better hint about the trough that's going to be developing in the West. So this is through Sunday into Monday. This is at the point when Debbie's been fully absorbed into this trough and flung out here into the Canadian Maritimes or North Atlantic. What I'll be watching in this forecast Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is this. There's the trough in the West. This is kind of the smashing of the ridge down South. And what we have to watch coming over the periphery of a ridge like this are little short waves that just sneak around and they kind of roll through the northern plains. They get in maybe into the central plains through the Midwest. And as they go over the top of that ridge, each one of those little tiny wiggles has the potential for producing 
you know, the risk of outbreak of storms. And so can you see here's here's a broader one by next Friday. You can see the ridge is really flattened out to the south. This is where the tropical system might be, according to the artificial intelligence, next weekend. And then the, look what happens. See this ridge just really placing itself and fixing itself down here in the south while this broad trough lives here. This has been several consistent forecasts and the models putting that down. And then what do we see? We see again by like Tuesday the 20th. There it is. These are the little things we have to watch. So there's going to be heat here, but little systems will roll the periphery of this and that might really increase the chances for getting some storms. So I want you to be thinking about that with me as we go through this forecast because this morning, you know, the radar is not showing that pattern setting up yet. We can see the flow coming around this, delivering this heavy rain in through here, an area that really, really needed to get some rain uh, lately. If we look at the um, all hazards weather map this morning, see the heat's been pushed pretty far to the south. We've got all of the flood watches and warnings that roll up the east coast, including a tornado watch here. Debbie has produced several tornadoes, I think 13 or 14 so far. I have to go back and look at the stats. But um, that's where our flood watches are. And then here, Mexico and into the panhandles. We have air quality issues in the northwest, some excessive heat watches, or advisories, excuse me, out uh, for this part of the, the Puget Sound and surrounding that area. And there's that frost advisory this morning. Now, I went um, you know, out there and looked for those temperatures. I'll show you in a few moments. But there's a lot of cold air that's driven itself into this section of the uh, of the U.S. And our severe storms today are primarily here, mid-Atlantic, northeast, and a couple of spots in the south. Here's tomorrow's outlook. Again, some of the high and western plains here. And this is the day on the 11th. All right. I think we got a better initialization this morning of the name. I didn't even show it to you yesterday because it was so bad. But this is better. And I just want to play this out to show you where this rain's coming through. Look at Colorado. Look at parts of Kansas, Oklahoma. This is getting through Saturday midday. There's a really good push of some rain into this area. More storms coming out into parts of Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, throughout the Four Corner States. As we watch Debbie and the deeper trough just leave as it brings in some scattered rain on the backside here in Ontario and Quebec. But that rain coming right in through here is hitting some critically dry acres. We just have to see how this pans out. Now, unfortunately, it does break up as it moves over toward the Mississippi River as we look out there all the way to Sunday. But overall, that was a, that was a good look at some good rain in this area from the high res NAM. If we look at the um, WPC forecast, this is the newest one just released this morning. Again, we're watching for very heavy rain, for example, into the interior of New York, getting into this part of Ontario, Quebec, and well into the Northeast uh, here as well. And uh, we then have to follow the next systems that come through the Central Plains, getting into Missouri and Illinois. But this is where things really start to jump around a lot for me. So we talked about this yesterday. So look at the WPC seven-day forecast. And now look at the seven-day forecast from the AIFS. And if I'm in Iowa or Illinois or Indiana, look, look at how much more rainfall the AIFS has in this area. It's drier in this part of the southeast and the lower Mississippi River Valley, including parts of the Ohio Valley. But by day 10, you can see where it's really just squashing that drier air and looking for a much more active pattern running around the periphery of that ridge. Now, that's the artificial intelligence forecast. Let's now go look at the NBM. The NBM, seven-day, similar, 10-day. Still, the, the model differences across this region are huge uh, in the current forecasts. And it's mainly the artificial intelligence that is the outlier. So I, I want to make a case that we now have another thing to be watching with the artificial intelligence to see if it's right, right? This is, a, this, is this testing we're doing with that model going forward. Um, here is the GFS. This would be its seven-day forecast. That's the 10-day GFS, seven-day, 10-day. And the GFS also brings the tropical system much closer to the East Coast, which is a wild card. And it's way more generous with the storms at times in the midsection of the country than the, uh, than the European is. So that's the European 7-day and the European 10-day. So take a look at the Ohio Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley, Texas. You know, what a contrast in the models we have right now. Now, I'm going to show you the differences between the models. This is just the seven-day forecast difference, European versus the GFS. And what I'm doing here is I'm subtracting. So if it's these colors, the GFS is wetter, these, the European is wetter. And there's some of the big differences right in through here versus here. 
That's just one area to be looking at in the midsection of the United States. Now, I usually run the models side by side for you, but I'm going to be honest, they're, it's not showing a whole lot of additional information to these maps. So let's get into some probabilities. And the newest European model probability for the next 10 days dropped significantly the risk of being very dry in that area. Now, this is an ensemble. I showed you the operational model and the artificial intelligence a moment ago, and it really you know, backed off on these risks in this area. Now, this is the spot that I continue to see the greatest risk of flash drought development. But as you know, at any point at the end of August, we could have a tropical system building here and come through and wipe out this risk, at, and it's not even yet represented in the forecast. The Western United States continues to stay very dry. This is not uncharacteristic of August though. So we have to just be careful to understand that this is not, this is expected. If we look at um, the probability of going over an inch, now I want you to know this is the zero Z run. So some of this rainfall was happening last night and it was included in this forecast. But over the next 10 days, this is this region that's expecting to get, you know, relatively healthy amounts of precipitation coming through according to the European uh, ensemble. We'll have to watch where the tropical system goes and what you've got here is just what's left of, um, of Debbie. All right. Okay. Looking out there into week two, interesting transition in the models finally picking up here, I think, on the risk of this area staying under that larger ridge. And as a result, having the risk of that flash drought development we've been talking about all week and, um, and with the heat that's going to be in place there, that's, that's going to be very problematic. What I'm anxious to see is how well did these storms build from the southern and western Canadian prairie all the way down into the central United States out into week two. And if we keep troughs coming through the northwest, you did notice, you know, I mentioned uh, on the drier side of things, let's go back to it, you know, this is normal. But take a look, we've got holes here. Maybe it's not in the Columbia Basin or the Willamette Valley, but there'll be places where we will get better rainfall activity in the northwest going forward. Temperatures. Take a look at the service ops this morning. Yeah, before, right as the sun rose, I had, there's a 36 here in this part of North Dakota, 39, 42, 46. I mean, it got pretty chilly here. I'm not sure that we saw a frost in this area, but maybe some low-lying ground did get a frost. Uh, impressive to see how cool it is behind this upper level uh, trough that's digging into the Great Lakes. Here's today's high temperatures. And again, watch the contrast from Texas into the Southern Plains. That's Saturday getting into Sunday. Remember, that's when the rain's moving through, keeping this area cool. But like we could be 101 in Amarillo and in North Central Kansas, maybe not even getting into the low 80s. Major differences in the temperatures here. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you just see the heat sticking around down here. And the day five through 10 forecast continues to follow what we talked about yesterday with now keeping this region cooler longer and that is primarily because the jet stream is doing something like this. And it's leaving this smashed ridge to the south. So we've got cooler in the northwest, hot running up the front range, hot in the south, but cooler conditions rolling in through this part of the United States. Day 10 through 15 also maintained that. But more heat is building in the forecast models here. And that's also reflected in the, uh, in the European. This is the next five days. That's day five through 10, and this is day 10 through 15. Now, just to remind you, this model was very aggressive on bringing in a lot of heat here earlier in the month of August, forecasting for the rest of August, and now it is not there anymore. Those are near normal temperatures with all of the risk of the highest heat staying down farther to the south. So all of that just gets us through the next two weeks. We gotta look beyond this now. I mentioned yesterday that there's some stuff going on, especially with the Southern Oscillation Index. And if you didn't get catch that, go watch it again. It's a good bit of that video talking about its relationship to temperature and precipitation, especially in the midsection of the country. The SOI dropped again yesterday, so it's now even lower. Remember, if the Southern Oscillation Index was jumping up like this, we'd be just talking only about La Nina. But right now, as it stands, it's not. And we're getting this kind of movement of the MJO sweeping through the Indian Ocean and maybe popping out phase four or five, which is over Australia. If you look historically when that's done that for the end of August, where do we get ridging? A lot of it was across the south and southeast with broader troughs here and troughs that zipped in off of the Pacific into the northwest at times. 
It's not a perfect match, but it could reinforce some of the pattern we just talked about. So that brings me back to the European model forecast. And I, I'll be honest, there's so much about this that I just keep scratching my head about. Are we really going to have the Pacific High strong and in the Gulf of Alaska? I, I, the model keeps going after this, but i got to wait to see if it actually manifests itself. Because if we just let the model be consistent with itself, let's go look at the 30-day precip. It does just keep the dryness here. And you can kind of see around the edge, it's trying to deliver storms. Again, we have no idea what the Gulf of Mexico is going to be doing with respect to developing tropical systems during this time, which could offset all of this in a hurry. But I do want you to see that the model is still very dry through here. And it's also just continuing to give this very, very warm forecast going forward. And I just want to be very cautious with this because as we looked at yesterday, it was much too warm across this area when forecasting for right now when I ran this model last month. So I think about the only area that I'm consistently seeing the heat is pretty much down in the south. I could probably expand that a bit, looking more a bit more like that. And maybe into the you know, the Continental Divide and, and the Western Plains seeing some hotter than average conditions. But um, I think for a lot of us, this is a bit bit too aggressive on the on the temperature side of it. So it's, a, it's sad to say this. I, I don't have any confidence in the near term, but we're just going to keep looking out there longer term. We, we should do this anyway. Earlier in the week, we looked at the new European model and just suggested, hey, we got more ensemble members dipping down to La Nina. The newest data came out from the National Multimodel Ensemble, it is more aggressive when you combine all the models at going into La Nina territory. You can see its average here, which is the dash line, dips down to almost a degree C below average versus the European, which kind of hangs up here about 0.3 C below average. So using all of that, I want to remind you what the models are saying. This is the fall and winter forecasts for precipitation. I made a point yesterday. I'm not going to show you the temperatures. They're too biased on the warm side. They don't make a lot of sense to me. So we're going to stay away from them and look at this. This is the precip forecast. I got it all labeled there for you. So we've already looked at this once. Let's now go look at the um, National Multimodel Ensemble. Now, in each of these next couple of graphics, I'm going to start here so you know what the models look like that go into making these figures. Upper left is just the average anomaly, but I want to look at the middle graphic on the top. These are the probability forecasts. And just like the European model, it is suggesting dryness into uh, fall across a broad section of the country with maybe one spot showing up a bit wetter, British Columbia and the Northwest. Let's now go over to November, December, January. Again, you can see the individual model runs. Pause it and have a closer look if you want. Here's the average anomaly. Let's look at the probability. Notice how the northern tier into the Canadian prairie begins to show up wetter. That's very consistent with what I've got here. See this from the European model? And this makes a lot of sense if, if they are correct, and let's go find it there, and we get really deep into La Nina at that point. This is a very typical La Nina precipitation pattern in November, December, January. And finally, we're going to do December, January, February, and uh, this is the probability there. Looks almost just like the European model overall, and this is just La Nina to the T. And I just don't understand, you know, what, if La Nina is going to be as strong as suggested, because it's not gotten going this summer, and we don't expect it to, by the way, but I just want to know if we're going to get this. Can this cold water really up well and get there? So this goes back to June. Let's blow that up for you. We're just watching your July. Look, see this? This has really got to surface and move across the northern excuse me, the upper part of the uh, Pacific Ocean, this being the surface of the Pacific Ocean, South America on this side, Australia, Indonesia on this side, and this is depth. That has got to come up there in order for that to occur. And if it does, then those model forecasts I just showed, well, they're going to be closer to right. But if it doesn't, if we can't get a good, strong trade wind going, consistently going to get this colder water to up well, then I think some of these longer term forecasts are going to bust. The other folks that are really waiting on it are going to be those in South America. Because as I showed yesterday, if you look, large high pressure center here, that's the subtropical high. Flow's coming around it, but it's not yet making this nice turn into Brazil, meaning the monsoon is still quite a ways away from getting going here. And we're going to have to wait and see how the monsoon eventually evolves. Could be a bit slow. Notice we've got the drier risk up here in the Amazon. 
but overall into December, January, February could be wetter than average for both the end of the soybean crop and the beginning of the safrina corn crop if there's drier risks in southern Brazil. And we're seeing that kind of forecast being echoed by the NMME. September, October, November, risk of being a bit drier, a little bit of a later start in the monsoon. What about October, November, December? It starts to peel back, it mainly stays to the north. And then November, December, January, the models are really pulling back on the risk of being drier across major growing years in South America. So that's what I got for you today. You all have a great weekend and we'll pick this up again on Monday. Thanks.